welcome back. And before we start, just a quick little announcement. Um, I'll actually be adding a number of new videos to the online accelerator program. And that's right, right here. I'm, I want to kick that off. This is a full video from that program, not a preview, right? And so I really hope you enjoy that. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet already. If you haven't yet joined the online accelerator program, again, it's a growing library of videos. I've included the link below. Um, just appreciate you guys, you know, hearing about your guys' success every single day, improving different areas of your game. Um, let's keep that up. Um, if you haven't started your five-week program, I recommend you doing so, uh, joining us in that members area. So well, without further ado, let's get started. We're going to talk about something called combos. And combos are a big thing if you look at any sport, whether it's basketball, you, know, you, you run a certain play where you might set a few screens, make a few passes, but it's in a deliberate way to try to get the shooter open, to try to get an easy layup at the rim. In boxing, right, you, you always see, I mean, it happens so fast sometimes, but when the boxers train, they're not throwing punch random, punches randomly. They're throwing at the head, they're getting the hands up, then they're going for the body. They're going for the body, body, the quick jab to the head. In a series of ways to get their opponent leaning and so they can open up more opportunities. Now, if you're more of a defensive player, and we talked about defense, you're, you're, you're back behind the baseline and you're playing a lot of balls up the middle, maybe a lot of balls high and deep, you're neutralizing. Combos and, and running plays and patterns are not for when you're playing defense. So if you're playing against a player who's way better than you are and hitting more aggressive and, and making you scramble, you're probably not going to be running many combos. Combos are for when you're trying to open up the court. Now, typically when you open up the, up the court, whether it's with angle, direction, spin, it's hard, at least at if you're not Roger Federer or Rafa Nadal, it's hard to really hit a winner on just one ball. It's going to take... Even, even at that level, a couple balls to, e to get an even better shot, right? And so, you know, we talked about the easy one where you use direction, where you go one, two, right? Where you're, you're using direction. You can use depth, deep, and short. You can use spin. But we're going to talk about, even more importantly, the combos on, uh, on the serve, okay? So there's something called close combat versus... A, a more neutral position. So if you think about boxing, if you ever watch boxing, I know you're, you're, you're ten, we're all tennis players here, we're not boxers, but boxing has an interesting combat dynamic that is very similar to tennis, okay? So in, in boxing, a lot of times, you'll see two, two fighters kind of dancing around, kind of sizing up their opponent, their spacing, okay, their strengths and weaknesses, and, and that's called a neutral position where the two players are sizing each other up. And that's equivalent so if, if I'm rallying, we're rallying deep behind the baseline. In, in a neutral position, it is really difficult to both win, to hit like a, a clean winner from like way behind the baseline, and it's hard to lose a point in one shot. Okay, there's a little bit more padding and leeway, right? To work yourself into the point, to gain position and lose position. Because we're farther away, so in a boxing, you might see a few light jabs. It's hard to throw a knockout punch when the guy is perfectly set up in a neutral position. Now, if you, I'm going to show you some boxing clips all as well. There's something called close combat in, in boxing when two fighters get really close together and are throwing a lot of punches. So close combat, the basically everything is accentuated. If you have a good position in close combat, you can really nail your opponent in, in, in the head in boxing or, or what have you and knock your opponent out. At the same time, if you if you're in close combat and, and you don't have your hands up and you're off balance, your opponent can knock you out. All right, let's look at a real boxing scenario. We have the great Muhammad Ali, and uh, a good example of close combat. What you see here is dancing around, sizing his opponent up, but then he closes, and when he closes, you see a huge flurry of punches, right, in this close combat, because this is when it's either now or never, it's either where you take advantage of the situation or you get nailed. And here Ali is going all out in this close combat situation. And just how we talk about close combat being a double-edged sword. Now if you come in like Ali and you're on balance here, you can create an enormous opportunity for yourself. Now like Ali's opponent who comes in with without being balanced or well without being well positioned, you could pay a huge price and leave yourself vulnerable to a counterattack. And it's the exact same thing in tennis. So when I'm back to the baseline 
I'm back at the baseline hitting shots here, you know, there's, I'm hitting shots here, boom, there's a lot of time in between each and every hit. It, it's almost like this is that neutral position, right? I mean, you still can hit a remarkable shot, much less likely. But when I, I get inside the court here, you know, boom, I, I'm hitting a short ball, I'm hitting a volley, I'm hitting an overhead, that's the balls, there's much less time in between each shot. Likely, if again, a great volley can win the point or a bad volley you can lose the point. Moving into the court and taking a close combat stance, a close combat position is a double-edged sword, okay? It can help you, it can also hurt you, depending. So, moving inside the court and, and, and engaging in close combat, likely you're gonna do that when you have a, a better position in the point rather than a worse position, right? If you have a bat, if, if you're off balance or what have you, you're gonna try to maybe scoop back and play a defensive shot to neutralize and create a point, again, where you've, you've neutralized that close combat position, you've taken it out of a close combat, created more time, right? So I want you to understand that's the close combat scenario. Now, what's really interesting about to know about the close combat scenario is if, if you've ever played like a ground stroke tie break, ground stroke rally, you know, there's a certain, when you feed the ball, like a hundred, underhand feed, there's a, a certain rhythm to that, to that rally. And, and that's automatically in a neutral position. But when you're playing an actual match with serves, if you've ever noticed when you serve and you're in return, there's a lot of people, a lot, a lot more dynamic to that in terms of being off balance. And so we call the first four balls of any rally, the serve, return, third ball, and fourth ball, the first four balls, we call that a close combat scenario. And so with that being said, you see a lot of combos, because it's a close combat scenario, we see a lot of combos and opportunity to win the point in those first four points. And it's very easy to run combos off the serve. So let's say you're serving, and they call it a one-two punch, and this comes from boxing, but they call it a one-two punch in tennis as well because there's a similar scenario, you can go slice out wide there, right? And that, which opens up the court for an up the line forehand there. If, if you can go slice out wide to their backhand, or sorry, to their forehand, and then you can pull a backhand cross court. And so you can run all kinds of combos off the serve. And so we're gonna go through some scenarios. And the most common one is, let's say I'm the returner, I'm returning serve here. And if, if I get a slice out wide here, boom, I, my direction's moving off the court to the right. My opponent's gonna rip the ball the other way. The other scenario is if, if they hit a great T-serve, boom, I'm, um, I'm, my direction is moving toward the middle of the court. It's easy, a common play is they go behind me, back behind me there for the winner. All right, we're gonna see both of those. But there's so many plays you can run off the serve. And again, if you're better at angles, let's say you, don't, you, don't, you have more finesse, you don't have as much strength and power to hit through the court, you might be running more plays off angles and drop shots and short slices. And you might do a short slice off the serve. You might do a serve and volley. So it really depends and you have to really assess, again, what's strong for you and build off that, your different combos. And you can have combos for every situation. Those are just off the serve. Uh, a lot of players with a, a big Western, you know, a, an extreme Western grip who had a lot of topspin, love the combo where they run back, and kind of similar to the lob relob play. They like to hit that big lob topspin to the, their opponent's backhand and then cheat and come around here and wait for that hammer shot inside the court because they have that western grip they can drive that hammer down. That's a very common play. So there's so many different plays you can run, you can get creative. And now let's go into the point section. First few points, nothing special. I just want you to notice essentially how fast the ball is moving back and forth. The bang bang type of nature. And it's just quite easy to get your opponent off balance, even right there, reaching, right? Just hitting a ball that's uncomfortable. And like I said, you know, these are your, gonna be your easiest winners to really open up the court and gain an advantage early in the point right there. Because essentially in this next point, you're gonna see me hit a defensive slice right there, right? And once you hit that defensive slice, it becomes a ground stroke like point where you see the student hit a handful of great forehands, but he has to hit like five or six shots and really work the point again before he gets his opportunity. You're gonna see opportunities that come really quickly off the serve here. 
So in terms of different combinations, so we're going to go through some of the most common ones. First is the serve out wide, the classic one to serve out wide and you rip the ball to the open court. Okay, there's one there and here's another a very similar scenario, right? And to make this automatic, it just makes life so much easier, you don't have to think about it. Now, you could say, well, the student was just slow recovering. Well, on these, that one, and the next few, see how my, how my body is actually moving off the court. It it, open, it makes that next shot so much easier. One more, my body is moving off the court. Ideally, that's what you want to create on your serve. These are a little bit different. Um, similar play off the serve. We're just moving the opponent toward the center of the court and hitting behind them. T serve, I'm moving toward the center opens up the other side of the court because your momentum is hard to change direction moving toward the center and rip the other way okay so you get to really watch your opponent move, right it, 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 could, it could be a body serve anything that's moving your opponent's body toward the middle it, you can open up that cross court again so those were plays off the serve and the third ball the first and the third ball here are some plays off the second ball and the fourth ball we hit a great return followed by a great fourth ball okay and this right here is pretty much a classic uh, power direction combo now on this one's a little bit different so I actually I use depth and push him back see how he's hitting on his back foot which allows him to produce a slightly shorter ball I'm inside the court moving forward I don't have to hit it. the ball as hard because I was inside the court I have more angle to work with I've already hit the first ball deep to push him back, second ball's angle here to win the point. So this is a great play to run, this is again full speed. I love that return up the middle regardless because so many great things happen and it's safe, it gives you good margin. Now the student actually gives me a dose of my own medicine here, the rip up the middle pushed me back, I pop it up short, and the rest is history. So based on the last few examples of points, you might be thinking, okay, it's unrealistic to hit a really great serve and to try to rip a winner on the very next ball. And I totally understand that. So actually, a lot of the times, your plays will just give you an advantage in the point and help set up the point. Okay, like unless you're playing at a professional level, again, you have to assess what level you're playing at. If you're not quite as good, hey, you can run a, a combo that might be, you know, three or four balls long and... Actually, a combo with a few more shots helps spread that risk out. Instead of taking a huge amount of risk on one shot, spread that risk out over three or four shots. Okay, so there's no shame in really, and, and like like these points here, are essentially, um, the the one two punch not winning the point but giving you advantage in the point. Okay, and so that's why any player at any level, granted that you have some ability to execute some of these types of shots, right? Whether it's opening up the court, hitting short and deep, um, etc., right, can at least give you some advantage in a point. The last thing I wanted to mention here with close combat is, I know this is off a serve, and it's like a you know a serve and volley type of thing, um, and you can definitely serve and volley, of course, but you can force the issue essentially and create a close combat scenario, right? Like you you can actively choose to make this happen and especially if you're playing an opponent who chips a lot of you know hits a lot of high floating and defensive slices uh, feel free to move and close that time gap and this allows you to again put balls away again if these had floated deep and hit the baseline he's completely reset the point but I don't let him do that in fact if you consistently do that, you're going to force your opponent to, you know, attack the ball. And if that's uh, how you want to change the game and take that defensive slice out of the equation, by all means, do that. You know, if you're a defensive grinder and you enjoy playing really long rallies, well, again, you know, that's really up to you and how you design your game. Okay, but you know, close uh, close combat, it can be good. Like by right care when you're in position, it it can be not so good. As we, as we showed, if you're off balance, it's, it's whoever's in a better position when that close combat occurs. So you want to be selective, um, but just know that also, like you see in this one, uh, I come in on a neutral ball. It's not good, it's not bad on this servant volley, so it's okay. You know, I'm fine taking that chance. And sometimes you just come in, like you see in this point, 
right here and I get lucky. So I just that's really a, a lucky shot. Um, but it does what I call it does create more variability. Uh, you see some you know interesting things happen in close combat. Obviously, because when you you go into close combat, anything can happen because you both players are hitting less balls compared to let's say you know if you're playing a better opponent and, and you're the worst opponent and you're grinding it out. Well, then both sides are going to hit you know hundreds of balls. So over time, you're going to see uh, more separation between the players. Sometimes when you, you take more risk in a close combat situation, you can really throw your opponent off because you guys are hitting less balls. Both of you guys uh, sometimes that variability could help you, and you could you know steal a set and you know get quote get lucky unquote right that type of thing. Some crazier things can happen. So uh, use this to your advantage, and we'll see you on the next section. Now I want to just leave you with one more uh, set of clips on implementing combos into your game. And what I have here is the student serving, these, again practicing off the serve, and as he serves, we're just going to pick a play, whether it's hitting, let's say, up, uh, serving up the tee, and then ripping to the open court behind the opponent, what have you, and I'm just feeding that ball immediately so he's forced to get ready, see the ball early, and, and pre-program that decision making into his mind. Of course, look, there's always a situation a matchup comes up where you might have to change your shot selection up. But for the most part, if you pre-program it your plays in, then you can let it come more natural and more instinctive without having to think about it and using all this mental energy thinking about it when you could be using that mental capacity to do other things, such as watching your opponent, um, you know, keeping track of, of the, you know, changes in strategy and, and tactics as the match progresses, etc. right? And so the more plays you have ingrained in your mind, the more uh, reflexive it will be. And uh, when things come natural and when there's no hesitation, it will just be that much more effective. You won't waste time. And you can see players who are deliberately thinking about running their plays um, it's very hard to execute when you're thinking, all right? So practice as much as you can.